Good morning and welcome to uh, Hugoton United Methodist Church. A couple announcements to start out with. Uh, children's offering coins uh, for this month will be going to Camp Lakeside at Scott City. The church is still looking to fill two positions. These are paid positions. One's the high, high school youth leader, and then they're looking for custodian also. Uh, contact Milton Gillespie if you're interested in his contact information is in the bulletin. They're also looking for volunteers to help during worship services with the audio, PowerPoint, and videos. Today, um, one change, the church council meeting has been changed to 4 o'clock this afternoon. And then there's a community poem service at 6 p.m. at Bethel Friends Church. This Wednesday, uh, candy and filler donations to fill Easter eggs. They need to have them here at the church by 4 o'clock. There's fellowship quilting at 1.30. Praise Kids runs from 3.45 to 5.15. Junior UMYF is at 6 and senior UMYF is at 7. And then Easter Sunday, that will be the last Sunday for family pictures from 10.30 to 10.55 and 12 to 12.15. And the egg hunt will be at noon. So uh, any other announcements? Sorry. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that April 26th, Tuesday, is Commodities, and we would welcome anyone that wants to come and help. Um, again, you can come and meet us at Liberal at 8 or at the VFW at 915, and there are all levels of help. If you're big and strong, we have jobs for you, but if you can only carry one can at a time, we have jobs for you as well. Um, they are, they've kind of put out their post-COVID schedule, so we will have April, we will skip May, and then we will have June. So for anyone needing community service hours, you want to be sure to get, get in on this so that you can uh, get those recorded for NHS or whatever other activity you might have going on. Or just doing it out of the goodness of your heart is welcome as well. So uh, We're going to try again this year to have the birthday supper. Um, it seems like every year since COVID, it's kind of been put off. So May 1st, we're going to give it a whirl and have a set-down dinner and have a nice what we serve. The kids will serve you. Um, we'll auction off 12 cakes. Um, the kids have decided to use half of the money for a youth trip this summer and half of it to go to Restore Haiti. So um, come on May 1st, ready to have some good food and good hot. Thanks. So I want to... Um reiterate something um, the commodities distribution uh, normally I go to uh, normally I, if I remember and I'm available <laughs> I go to liberal and help unload the truck and I will not be here this month sorry I'll be out of town Nancy so uh, if somebody is um, feeling inspired or at least just feeling like uh, God's making them feel guilty then uh, I, they would love to have an extra set of hands out unloading the truck uh, and I want to um, also spotlight our uh, our photo directory project. I was talking um, this morning, and I think we've got 15 families, which might not seem like a lot, but it's actually probably a little over half the people in the congregation have gone and gotten their picture taken. But that means there's plenty of folks that we still need to swing through there. And so if you will, please, this afternoon, after church or next Sunday, we would very much appreciate it. There's more people that just come to us, there's fewer people we have to call and email and say, would you please consent to being a part of us on paper? Um, so please, uh, please help us with that. Thank you. Anything else? If not, would you please stand as able for the call to worship? I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. Those who choose other gods multiply their sorrows. As the holy ones, they are noble in whom I delight. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body rests secure. For you do not give up the shield, or let your faithful ones see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Please remain standing and our opening hymn is Hosanna, Loud Hosanna, found on page 278 in your hymnal. <laughs> Thank you. 
about what the words were. I said, just say, sing Hosanna. That's all you need to know. Right? It worked, didn't it? Yep. What was that called when we came in? It's called a processional. A processional. Because we came in singing. And we were waving our palm branches. And normally, the person in charge is on a big white horse and there's big soldiers, and they have all of their armor, and it's a parade. But this one was different. This one was spontaneous. It wasn't planned. They just had the disciples find a little donkey and she was tied up and they came and asked the person said that my master is in need of this and he let him have it and they put their coats over the horse the little monkey and they started proceeding through Jerusalem that's why we call this Palm Sunday the people weren't expecting it. The, these people here weren't expecting for you to come down the aisle waving your palms. Were they? 
It surprised him. And it was spontaneous. It came out of this part of you. It's like saying when you have a home run, yeah! Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. The king is coming. The king's on a donkey. But they knew that the Messiah was predicted to come in that way. It was a really great week. Everybody was so excited. And they didn't have anything to wave, and they wanted to wave more than just their hands. So they had palms off of the trees and waved them. Other people took their cloaks off and put it on the ground so that the donkey could uh, proceed with that. And it was just so exciting to know that the Messiah that they had been told about came. He was here. He was where he was supposed to be. And then, Monday Thursday came, and they celebrated the Passover meal. And Jesus told them that what they were going to do, that he was going to die. And that in three days, he would rise again. So we have this week, Monday, Thursday. We have when he was eating the Last Supper with the disciples. And then we have Good Friday, which it wasn't a very good Friday because they crucified my Lord. But if he had not died for my sins, I would still be in sin. So that's why we call it Good Friday. And then we have Easter. And Easter, the tomb was... Okay. The tomb was empty. He had risen. And you know what? He's going to come back. Jesus is coming back. And we're not going to know when. It's going to have to be spontaneous. We're not going to know the song. We're just going to have to sing Hosanna and wave our palm. We don't get to practice. We get to just love Him and thank Him. Okay? Okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You. We praise You for Jesus riding on a donkey. So we can say, Sing Hosanna. Sing Hosanna. Amen. Okay, you need a bucket.
Our hymn of preparation this morning is Were You There? And it's found on page 288 of the hymn. Send our prayers for her and peace and God's presence in her life as she adjusts to a new reality and 
let us remember her when we go forth to, uh, to encourage her and remind her that she's still our sister in Christ. Um, I want to uh, lift up Janet Stutz and her family. She lost a grandson this week. And um, we're still doing arrangements, but I believe the funeral will be here the day after Easter. And then um, I don't have an update on Charlie Wagner, but I know he's been, uh, been unwell. And maybe somebody can help fill us in on Charlie. <coughs> Are there other prayer requests today? Ukrainians working for us. I know some people know about that. And this one of them, their family came over this week, so they know no English. They're young kids. We just just hope that they have an easy transition coming mm -hmm. over here. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Our brothers we'd like to lift up today. I was chided at the first service for not praying for rain. <laughs> oh. I got you, Dale. <laughs> Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come together today and as we just considered this, just this moment, there's so much to be thankful for in it. The fact that we have a place. We belong. There is a purpose for us on earth. There is a place, a, a relationship where we belong on earth. And we get the answer to so many of these deep-seated needs and hungers of life right here in your presence and our relationship with you in this family that you've made for us and a future that you have mapped out for us and painted a picture of and said we have a part in it and we have a part in going towards it. God, we thank you for just this simple every Sunday morning miracle that maybe we take a little bit for granted. God, we are in awe and we're unworthy. And we are incomplete without it. And so God, we thank you. God, we come together today, uh, as we do so often, uh, pulled in so many directions of so many minds and so many concerns. And, and, and Lord, we thank you that we come together in this moment and there is only one concern. And there is only one thing and that is you. And we reorder our understanding of life and the universe and setting our sights on you and gazing on you and your goodness and your love and your power and, and just the wonder that comes from experiencing you. That incredible, miraculous presence we have found that has called us here over and over again. And so God, we thank you. And God, we're excited. And God, we want to be excited. Help us to be excited. And God, we are grateful because at least a little bit, we realize how much you've done for us. And Lord, we want to be more grateful. We want to see the vast expanse of your love that's been manifest in our life and the lives of those we love. We, help us to see more how much you're doing just so that we can be grateful for it. And God, we are hopeful for the future that you have made for us on this life and in eternity. And, and God, help us to be more hopeful. Help us as we learn who you are better, as we deepen in our relationship with you, as we come to love you and trust you more, to see that hope more clearly and realize how good it is and what a gift it is that, that you made a place for us in it. Help us to be more and more hopeful. God, today, as, as uh, we consider all these things, as we consider why we're here and why it's called us back and back and back into your presence, Lord, um, there are so many concerns and so many prayers to lift up, people that we love, people that are hurting, people who are not here. And, and God, we have no easy answers for those things. We just have a profound answer that we find in you that says, hang on. <laughs> that, say, that says you're redeeming this. And in time we will see, and in time it will be set right and made right. 
and these things that, that trouble us and these things that hurt us and this pain and suffering and fear that we see all around us, that thing will pass away. And so, God, we are grateful even in that because we know that the present time of darkness points to a future without it. God, in the midst of these times, we do pray for your miraculous intervention, for your presence, for the manifestation of your love where we just know it in that profound way that just says, God is with me. And God, we pray for ourselves, but we pray for our brothers and sisters too. We pray for the Stutz family as they go through this time of unanticipated and tragic loss. God, we pray for, uh, for Charlie and for Joyce as they are wrestling with a season of life that is difficult and wears on them and, and uh, forces them to see life in new ways. And God, help them to see that there is something unchanging in all this, and that is the promise of your hope, the promise of your presence, the promise of your love. God, we live in a world that is unsettled and seemingly more so every day. And in the midst of that uncertainty, God, we pray for your presence that gives certainty for those who are uh, dealing with the uncertainty, who are dealing with the fear and dealing with the suffering, God, for those who are um, caught up in forces far beyond their control that disrupts their lives and threatens their loved ones. God, help them to know, to know that there is something secure and it's found in you and it's given in love. And God, today, just in this moment, as we gather and we appreciate the many miracles that stack up to now, uh, help us to just really be present in this moment, that our praises, that our worship would be with everything we have, and that it would help us to make it more so, so that it would be pleasing to you. That really would be an expression of our love and wonder and gratitude to you. God, as we come together today and, and seek you and try to know you better and try to be more like you and walk this walk and live this life with you, God, reveal yourself to us. Encourage us on this journey. Help us to see, pull us onward. God, as we declare our faith and trust in you, fulfill it. We believe, help our unbelief. Bind us more tightly to you. Do the thing that we can't do ourselves. Help us to live into this holy mystery that is our relationship with you. God, even as we praise you and celebrate you and as we seek you and, and as we beseech you, help. We know that there is no help except in you and that it is given freely and with profound love. And so God, we are grateful. God, this season of Lent and this season of Easter that we, anticip that we anticipate so greatly when we just celebrate your great works, I pray that you would help us to do so with whole hearts, knowing humbly how much we need it and knowing excitedly how much it is given to us. God, we ask these things in your name. As we say the prayer that your son Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand for this morning's reading? The reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 58. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable body must be put on, imperish must put on imperishability and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability and this mortal body puts on immortality, 
then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, thanks be to God. God. Sermon back in <laughs> the American Frontiersman Daniel Boone is um, inevitably and inescapably linked with the state of Kentucky. And um, he's, he's the one who opened it up for settlement and during the period of westward expansion and um, really did some pretty amazing things there. Pretty cool stories. But there came a point in time in his life, in his later life, where he was the subject of a lot of... Um, probably frivolous and opportunistic lawsuits. We don't know anything like that today. Um, and, and lost a lot of money and, and eventually left Kentucky in frustration um, saying uh, what we would say today is keep, keep my name out your mouth and I'm never coming back. And uh, moved to the state of Missouri. So fast forward a few years and uh, Kentucky is applying for statehood. And they're trying to gin up all the kind of the, the story and the history and the prestige of the state and say it's exciting and we're going to add this thing to the country. And so as a part of that, they started really playing on Daniel Boone's legacy. And they sent some agents of the state to Missouri where Daniel Boone had died. And they dug him up in the middle of the night and took him back to Kentucky and, and buried him in Kentucky at this memorial they had already built for him, which is incidentally about 10 minutes from my seminary. So I've been there a couple of times. <laughs> And they proceeded to get into a fight that still goes on today about the location of his remains and uh, where is Daniel Boone buried? And of course, Kentucky says, well, we've got his bones, so he's buried in Kentucky. And Missouri says, well, we've pretty much got everything else of him, so I guess he's buried in Missouri. And it kind of, um, and although that is a peculiar story, there are little uh, similar events that are surprisingly common. I've heard two this week that are um, they're much more personal and local where the same sort of thing is going on. And it, it, it kind of invites some uh, fun and also some contentious questions. So these, uh, last week we read about when Jesus died on the cross and the tomb broke open and the dead walked. And like, well, if that happened, where would Daniel Boone walk? Would he rise in Kentucky or would he rise in Missouri? Or would it just not work at all? Or would like half of him rise in Missouri and half of him rise in Kentucky and, and 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 for that matter, what on earth is Daniel Boone? Like, what is the essence of him? And maybe you come up in New Orleans or like, what on earth is going on? And these are actually questions that the church has had to wrestle with because of some of our core doctrines. And and I think part of it, at the source of it, and what I want to explore today is this question: like, what about the body? Does it matter what happens to the body? This is our final Sunday of Lent, and over the last five weeks we have discussed the cross. And if you would, consider it like a prism. Remember those from school? And you're twisting it around. Uh, twisting is maybe a bad word. We're rotating it <laughs> and considering it at different angles and seeing how the light plays through it. And we're asking this, this series of questions about the cross. What does it mean? Why the cross? What's going on? Why did it have to be this way? And what is the result of it? What does it mean for us today? We have this infinite God who is in some ways just other. He's not human. He's not on earth. He's not sinful like we are. And he's just so much. It's kind of hard. It's not hard. It's impossible to wrap our minds around. And we know he's doing this incredibly deliberate, complex, nuanced work in the world that spans hundreds of generations. How do we take as much of that truth that we see revealed in God's work and make it our own? How do we understand as much of it as possible? How do we know God better? How do we, as a, one of my professors likes to say, and I've adopted this phrase, how do we claim all of God's truth? 
the first couple of weeks in this series, we talked about the problems that Jesus worked to overcome, the supernatural forces of evil, the devil and his power in the world. And then we discussed this uncomfortable fact that, that we also have some culpability. Each of us also has a sin problem. And that it's, a, it's, a, it's something we can't undo. And we needed someone to help us. And that someone was Jesus who came and died in our place to free us from the power of sin. And then we talked about what I've kind of called the progressive work of God, the positive work of God. God didn't just come to put a band-aid on creation, but he's doing something. He's still going somewhere. There's a work in progress. And that starts with ourselves. Being born again, our body's a temple of the Holy Spirit, becoming members of the kingdom of heaven on earth. And continuing to look out and realize that there is a huge, expansive work of God we call new creation. And we're a part of it. A time coming that is promised and described in the scriptures when this old problem of sin that has rippled brokenness across creation will finally settle and be gone for good. And today I want to talk about one more thing that we can pull from the cross. And I was kind of going back and forth between two or three things, and I realized that they're all really just different ways of approaching the same thing. I want to talk about the resurrection of the body. The Apostles' Creed in the final line says this, and by the way, I think it's in your bulletin. Yep. So if you want to look at it at some point, it says this in the final sentence. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Have you ever noticed that? It's all these little tiny fragments that have so much meaning in them. Have you ever stopped to think about what some of these mean? This, this creed has been like the kind of the the boiled down list of these are the inescapable beliefs of the church. What, if you ask the question, what is a Christian? There's a couple ways to approach it. But one is this, these set of beliefs have been binding to all of Christendom. And it includes this line, the resurrection of the body. About the resurrection of the body, Paul writes that without it, we preach a false gospel. Without the resurrection of the body, we have believed in Jesus in vain, it has invalidated everything we know and understand and put our hope in. Those are strong words. The resurrection of the body is indeed a core belief as a Christian. And yet, just speaking to my own experience growing up in the church, it's something I have rarely heard preached in any substance. Today we have this perception that our body is sort of like a car. And we get in it when we're born and we use it to get around in life. And at some point, our real self, this indefinable self that we call the soul, which is made up of our nature and personality and our thoughts and experiences, will escape this body. It'll go away. And that one's eternal. Do you know where this idea came from? It comes from Socrates. It doesn't come from the Bible. It comes from Socrates. And today, this influence in the church is usually referred to as Platonism, referring to Socrates' student, Plato. But this idea that there are two separate selves is explicitly and uniformly rejected by the church. I've read that at the time of, of uh, Jesus' ministry and life, that there were tons of ideas about what it means to be a person and what a person is, and even more ideas about what happens when a person dies. The early church's insistence on a clear understanding that this body will be resurrected in the same way that Jesus was resurrected by God for eternity was unique and controversial and something they were attacked for, but they clung to it. It was very important to them. They understood that the body is not like a banana peel that serves its purpose until a point of time and then is discarded and is awful. The body matters. Christ cares about our bodies and Christ cares about creation. Now part and parcel, maybe one of the consequences of this idea that the body is temporary and discarded is this church worldview that you might think of as escapism where it's like, just hold on. And you gotta be, I, I have to be careful sometimes the way I express <laughs> myself in this because I, I, 
almost get sucked into this language. There's this idea that the world is awful. And, uh, and, and you'll die eventually and get away from it. You'll go to heaven and, uh, and it won't matter anymore. And frankly, that is a message I've heard a lot in the church growing up. But at best, it's an incomplete understanding of what's God doing in the world. It takes this whole expanse of time in Scripture and boils it down to a very narrow season. Although none of us are Jesus, and there's things obviously that He does that we can, and He knows that we don't, He's still a role model for us. He's an exemplar. The God who was so far away and so impossible for us to discern came in human form. And one of the reasons is so that we could look at him, and we could talk to him, and we could listen to him, we could follow him, we could emulate him, consider what he did and why. And we learn a lot by looking at Jesus' ministry on earth. If you look at Jesus' ministry, you'll find his activities that are recorded in the Gospels come down to four major categories. And two of those are ministries to the body. He healed people. He raised people from the dead. He cast out demons. He freed people from the power of Satan. He also spent a lot of time eating with people, feeding people, breaking bread and fish. Jesus cared very much about people's bodies. And and, and I think it's important that we understand those activities were not throwaway activities meant to let people know he was cool so we could get to the important part. It wasn't advertising. But... Genuine expressions of, of what God cares about, which includes our bodies and this world. In theological terms, we call this idea embodied, meaning that our self, this, this larger esoteric sense of who we are, is embodied. It's, an, it's inescapably bound to a physical form. The soul, the spirit is not separable from the body. They're not two other things. Today we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and the truth is this entire chapter is about this subject, and I think it's brilliant. Um, And for Paul, it's maybe an easier read than some of his work, honestly. (laughs) Um, Especially once you kind of familiarize yourself. Familiarize. That's a word in Oklahoma. Familiarize yourself. Hush. (laughs) Um, with some of the language and the ideas we're talking about. And included these lines, verse 51 through 53. He says, listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must put a, put on imperishability and the mortal put on immortality. He says, we will not all sleep. And he's talking about experiencing a physical death. He's saying, presumably, when Jesus comes back that second time, there will still be people here on earth. That's good news for us today as we look around. Um, But we will all be changed, no matter our state. We will all be changed. This work of new creation in which... um, our bodies, once bound by the law of sin and death, that consequence of sin and reality, they'll be freed from it. The distorted, twisted reflection of the image of God that we're born into in this time will be cleared up and will truly and completely be image bearers like we were made to be. And we will be changed, clothed for eternity, for imperishability instead of for the grave. Now this is a very different message from when you die, if you're a good person, you'll go to heaven and you won't have to deal with this muddy rock anymore with all its problems. And eventually all the good folks will get together in heaven and we'll have a really great church service. It's a very different message. And i got to say, thank God, because I always wrestle with that idea of heaven. It sounds boring to me. And that is not the message of Scripture. Now, I want to look at Jesus a little bit longer. Always a safe bet in church. What does Jesus do? What does Jesus say? We already talked about the fact that a significant portion of Jesus' activities are physical in nature. Caring for people's bodies. Healing them. Expressing physical um, regard for them. Affection. I love you. You're important. I care about you. 
if Jesus is anything like the person we believe he is, it wasn't simply to coerce people or trick people or persuade people into listening to him, but a genuine expression of his loving nature. When Jesus died on the cross, he was buried in a grave, and as the scriptures say, he rose again on the third day. Jesus experienced a bodily resurrection. Just as Jesus condemned sin in the flesh on the cross, Jesus exercised his power over the grave. No longer did the grave have the final word. And Jesus sat in authority over even that terrible thing. Through the power of Jesus, those who are in the kingdom of heaven, those who believe, experience freedom from the power of the grave. Maybe not the experience of the grave, but the power of mortal death. And the case study goes on. When Jesus rose again, we see he was still clearly Jesus, and he was also fundamentally different. The scriptures indicate that he was so different that oftentimes people didn't recognize him at first. So I imagine it's like being at the store in another town and you see somebody you know, but you weren't expecting to see him there. So you just miss him or you're like, how do I know that person? He, He had this effect where he would talk to people, encounter people who knew him. And it took him a minute, but then they would, for whatever reason, take a closer look and there there'd be this, whoa, moment. It, it, it's you, you're alive. Clearly Jesus, and yet somehow different. The scriptures go to great pains to demonstrate that Jesus was not a ghost or a spirit or an apparition. Uh, apparition. They explain that Jesus walked with them both day and night, that he broke bread with them, he ate fish with them, he let people touch his wounds. He was, there's that word, embodied. The eternal divine Savior appeared in flesh, and his flesh was changed. What did Paul say? We will all be changed. In fact, the scriptures go on to explain that Jesus occurred in public and private in close proximity to hundreds of people, more than 500 people. God cares very much for our souls, our relationship with Him, and He also cares very much about our bodies. In the Old Testament, a significant portion of the law that God gives to Israel is about the body's welfare. It's about physical purity. A significant portion of Jesus' ministry is caring after the body. And when we look ahead, as we did last week, into this grand work of new creation, a new heaven, a new earth, we see it is material in nature. A reuniting completely and perfectly of heaven and earth and the reality that God desires it to be. And likewise, our sense of being, both in spirit and in body, is bound together. When we look at God, we see He is a redeemer. He's redeeming creation, and He is redeeming us, not casting us away. When we look at the totality of the, what we call, I like to think of as a orthodoxy, which is this, this mainline set of thought that has bound Christianity together over the millennia, we see that the doctrine of the resurrection of the body is, is something that's been a part of it from the beginning and to today. But a, but a question for a Sunday morning is, beyond being educational, why is this doctrine important? Why is this relevant? Why was this something that the church was so bound to? It said, we, we must have this. And Paul said, we must have this. And we preach a false gospel without it. Why did Jesus have to go to the cross for it? On one hand, it's part of God's truth. And, and that's good enough. <laughs> that itself makes it valuable. But it's also very pertinent on a personal level because... This conversation about the resurrection of the body is a a high-minded way of approaching something that's very personal to all of us, which is death. We're talking about death. The Gospel of John says it in a different way from Paul. He says, we will all die, but some of us may yet live. And Paul, of course, said, uh, some of you might still be alive at the end, but we will all be changed. But inescapable in this is that death is a consequence of this creation that's governed by laws marred by sin. Entropy, decay over time and use is a reliable fact of the universe and it does not spare us. Sadly, death is 
one of the few points in people's lives when they really want the church to play a role. They really want us to have something to say when they're dealing with death. And, it, and it's important that we have something worth saying on a day when we're dealing with death. If we don't, I don't know if we have anything worth saying. The, there's this idea that the earth is a bitter place and hold on because you're going to escape and that is a really incomplete expression of God's love. It actually sounds Buddhist. <laughs> Buddhism is life is suffering and the best you can do is minimize suffering in life by not caring too much about anything and then eventually you'll die and you'll be freed from suffering. That's not a message of hope. And that's not God's message. That isn't Jesus' message. The message we see on the cross is God saying, I'm coming to redeem you, and I've always been coming to redeem you, and I'm never going to stop, and I'm going to win. I'm going to restore you. I'm going to heal you from this grievous affliction, this terrible disease called, di uh, called sin that always results in death. And I'm going to come and restore all of creation. And guess what? You, all of you, is a part of creation. If you reach the end of your life, your body will experience a mortal death, but that no longer has the final word over you. If you are my people, if you're part of the kingdom of heaven, you are free from its eternal and final power. To wrap up today, I want to just pull a few passages out of 1 Corinthians 15. Now we've talked through these, so hopefully it's a little more natural to hear and easy to follow along. But today to close, I just want to let God speak through his word. We begin in verse 1 and 2. It says this, now brothers and sisters, he's talking to us. I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. And if you hold firmly to the word I preached you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Verses 3-8, through eight, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to scriptures. He appeared to Cephas, that's Peter. He appeared to the twelve and after that to more than 500 of our brothers and sisters, most of whom are still living, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, Jesus' brother. Then to the apostles, and last of all, to me, Paul. Christ appeared in the flesh to hundreds of witnesses. Verse 14 through 16. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is our faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not also raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. Freedom from death is promised. It's part of the messianic promise that binds Israel to God. They talk about it in a number of places. Ezekiel 37 does so eloquently. If the Messiah came back and didn't fulfill these prophecies and free people from the power of death, he wasn't the Messiah. Verse 20 through 26, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom of heaven to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion and authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. The last enemy to be destroyed is in this work that we see begin on the cross is death. And when that happens, when Jesus has brought all of creation under the dominion of the kingdom of heaven, all people and all things, then Jesus will turn it over to his Father and heaven and earth will be restored as one as God always intended it to be. 
passage concludes in verse 58, and it's a great benediction for today. It says this, therefore, I love that word, because of all this, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Death does not have the final word. Therefore, let nothing move you out of the will and purpose of God. Give yourselves completely and fully in all you do to the Lord. And know that your efforts are never in vain. God has the power and the desire to redeem them in the proper time. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. You always pull us outward and pull us upward and lift us up from from where we are and what we understand and what we are. And you show us there's something better. That your desire for us is incredible. Your love for us is unimaginable. (laughs) If you weren't truth, we'd say it was irrational. Why? And you do love us so much. And you have made such a place of hope for us. You're doing such an incredible thing. Here today, Lord, as we as we go through these moments that we have, as we try to make the best of them, God, I pray that you would help us to see you more clearly, to labor more valiantly, to want to, to just want to desperately to be a part of what you're doing and to see our hope and trust in you growing and growing and growing because every time we see just a little bit more of you, we realize how much more there is to see and how good it all is. God, we thank you. We know that we're bookended by birth and by death. And that is a profound reality to live in. And we have this promise from you that that is no longer the case. That the grave is no bar to your call. That the grave has no power over your people. And God, we thank you. Lord, we lift up our thanks today in the name of the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our offering plates are at the door in the foyer, or you can mail your um, ties to the Hugoden United Methodist Church, or you can also submit them online. Uh, And our, let us please stand now for, and sing the doxology. Found on page 277, Tell Me the Story of Jesus.
please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I don't recall if we announced this at the beginning, but I want to make sure we invite you to the community service this evening at Bethel Friends Church. This is the Palm Sunday service that we put on every year as a part of the Ministerial Association. And uh, I at least always have a good time there. And it's, it's great to see that um, how expansive the kingdom of God is. And how many different types of folks come together and have encountered God in different ways and worship different ways, but are still very much bound by Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Um, We are a people of hope. And we live in a world with real concerns and real constraints. And it's okay to feel that. And it's okay to look at it and for it to hurt and for it to worry us. But that's not the spirit that God gave us. We have a message of profound love that says no matter what you're facing, I got an answer for it. And I'm going to win. And you're going to be a part of the victory. And the victory's already been won. And we're just, uh, not just, but we're walking to it. And we get to be a part of it day by day by day as we share our lives with God and grow into that kingdom together. And so I want to encourage you, go forward with hope. The worst thing we can imagine ultimately is bound up in death. And Jesus has said, I got that too. I don't have the final word anymore. I do. And you can be alive with me. And so go forward with hope and live in the real world. We don't have to be myopic. We don't have to hide from it. Um, because we have real enduring truth that answers all those things for us. You are dismissed.